I had Stefan Guine on the show and we were talking about type two diabetes and he sort of defined it as a disease of energy toxicity. There's you know, increased energy available. The body has to store that somewhere. If it cannot store it subcutaneously where it is, I'm not sure if benign is the best way of describing it, but relatively benign, at least not as metabolically damaging. Uh, if it if it no longer has that capability, begins to store it in the, the liver, eventually in other organs like the pancreas. And you know he's probably referring to Roy Taylor's twin cycle hypothesis here. Um, but is that is that what we're talking about here? Just to kind of clarify it, it's very similar to type two diabetes in that this is a disease of energy toxicity. And if overweight obesity didn't exist in the numbers that it does today, would we see non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? There's probably two two components to that question that are that are worth teasing apart. Uh, the, the first is it, can we can we define this similarly as as kind of energy toxicity? Um, I think overall the evidence is pretty clear that the primary driver of the net accumulation of fat in the liver is energy excess, it's chronic energy excess. So in that context, it it it, it could you know share within that that overall definition as 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 Stephen King applied to to type two diabetes, and indeed Roy Taylor's twin cycle hypothesis is positing something similar, uh, where you have the you know continued accumulation of fat in the liver spilling over then to other important visceral organs, metabolic organs and tissues, the pancreas in particular. Um, impairing the capacity of of the beta cells to 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 produce and secrete and uh, insulin and respond to and assist in the reduction of blood glucose levels. So could it be characterized in that way? I think the overall evidence would suggest it could. There are dietary factors then that influence can exacerbate or indeed attenuate the influence of energy at different levels whether we're talking surplus or or energy balance um we know in for example if we're if we're really stratifying evidence according to the level of energy that hypocaloric interventions almost irrespective of macronutrient composition irrespective of of type of diet will reduce the level of fat in the liver so in that context you know that that again yes it, it fits within this broad characterization that we have an excess uh, an effect of, of chronic excess energy intake that is of course going to be influenced by certain constituents at a macronutrient level of the diet but that overall then in the broadest possible terms hypocaloric interventions the the effect of net energy restriction and reduction will be to allow for the mobilization of stored fat in the liver the utilization of that fat or oxidation and the net reduction of the level of 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 excess fat that is accumulated in in cells in the liver so i i think that term is uh you know, overall, uh, something that 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 could possibly be applied for for a lot of the metabolic um, components of, of 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 chronic lifestyle diseases that we are non communicable diseases that we have. But I think so. The second component of that, you know, it is important, given what we've touched on, particularly with the ethnicity differences, but not even just related to that alone to note that although the relationship overall between say for example BMI and metabolic disease and that includes both fatty liver and diabetes is strong the strength of that association is particularly notable at higher BMIs but there are but it's not a linear relationship entirely 
particularly at BMI ranges that we might classify as quote unquote normal or even just kind of the lower range of what we would classify as overweight. Um, particularly if we're talking about, you know, Caucasian or, or non-Asian populations where that would be, say, between 25 to 30. And those areas are gray because they're areas that are very prone to misclassify an individual relative to, for example, someone who has a greater proportion of lean body mass, like a very recreationally active uh, athlete is going to have potentially proportionately greater lean body mass and, and lower fat mass, but could easily have a BMI of, of, of 28. This episode is proudly brought to you by Inside Tracker. Track your blood biomarkers, understand your biological age, and receive personalized lifestyle tips backed by evidence to optimize your health. To get started with Inside Tracker today and get 20% off your first purchase, head to insidetracker.com forward slash Simon. That's insidetracker.com forward slash Simon for 20% off. I think that's my BMI. It might, my BMI is tw- 29 points. Like I'm, I'm nearly, I'm nearly, nearly class one obese. <laughs> You've got um, more muscle than me, clearly. So, <laughs> I think so, I'm, tw- I'm 28 you know, point something. <laughs> Okay, you need to eat more. Um, so, <laughs> but 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 that is that is a real example of 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 that limitation. I mean, so but 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 conversely, it could misclassify someone who. So in in, in that context, neither of us are are particularly high risk individuals, right? But it can classify misclassify someone who is a risk by virtue of 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 missing more subtle markers that we're discussing. And the point I'm, I'm tying this back to is that individuals can still accumulate fat in the liver uh, that it is relative to their body size, potentially not around the levels that we might currently diagnose fatty liver as, but still represents quite a high burden of triglyceride in the liver. And so there are these refinements there, and, and we've known this with, with type 2 diabetes risk, for example, that individuals within a normal range, when, when I mean, say normal, I mean classified as normal weight according to BMI, 18.5 to, to 25, may still develop type 2 diabetes. And there are, of course, genetic factors at play there, but there are also some of these modifiable factors at play. Um, and, you know, even a study we've discussed, uh, you know, recently is Roy Taylor's group's recent publication of the, the retune study, uh, which was looking specifically at the potential for, for, for kind of remission of type two diabetes to be achieved in individuals with type two diabetes, but whose BMI was in a range of 21 to 27, um, and what's fascinating, I think, as it relates to liver fat specifically in that study is just so we're, we're not veering too much into, into type 2 diabetes, although they're obviously highly correlated. What I thought was particularly interesting from the fatty liver component within that study is at baseline, these individuals either classified as, again, BMI of 21 to 27. So they're in the range of normal to you know, the, the the very low end of what would be the overweight category for BMI. And their baseline liver fat levels were around 4%. So they wouldn't be meeting the, the current diagnostic threshold by, by a percentage, you know, a percentage short. However, what was most instructive was that compared to BMI matched non-diabetic healthy controls, their levels of liver fat were three times greater than those non-health, uh, healthy, non-diabetic BMI-matched controls. And of course, the liver then responded to the effects of the, the very low-calorie uh, um, liquid-based plus non-starchy vegetable dietary intervention that, that, that has been the, the hallmark intervention used in, in Taylor's research and the direct study and otherwise. And if I remember afterwards, I think their 
there the it was around two percent post intervention. So notwithstanding that these individuals are in this BMI range, there is still obviously relative to their body size a proportionately greater level of fat in the liver compared to non-diabetic healthy controls that is clearly influencing the overall pathophysiology of the condition. And of course, that's the primary hypothesis behind the retune study, this, this idea of a personal fat threshold, um, whereby you the, whereby the underlying kind of pathophysiological influences on you know the, the metabolic um impairments that characterizes type 2 diabetes are similar such that the effect of an intervention like a low energy diet for a period of time will will lead to the same uh you know outcomes and and ultimately you know that study provides some early support for that hypothesis what was interesting is just that the actual magnitudes required to achieve that differed because their overall body mass is obviously lower so whereas the direct study ha has has suggested that you know people starting from an o an a, a, an obese bmi are going to require at a minimum 10% and probably more likely 15% of of initial body weight loss in this study it was around 6.5% that was required to normalize HbA1c um, with the corresponding reductions in in liver fat and otherwise. So, so I think it is important to stress that while overall adiposity and higher BMIs, you know, always correlate very strongly with the risk of and uh, the presence of fatty liver and the risk of metabolic disease um, and cardiovascular disease, the actual risk is not only characterized uh, by higher BMI, particularly if we're using that as a metric, um, and that individuals may accumulate, you know, and, and develop the underlying pathologies related to metabolic disease at what would appear to be a, quote, normal BMI, but clearly under the hood, the actual metabolic effects um, are are different relative to you know uh, otherwise healthy controls